Doug's not ready. We can't start yet. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> if Doug's not ready, I'm not ready. You ready? Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Roots. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors. Will you stand with us as we begin by lifting up our voices, singing together in worship to Jesus? Amen. By the way, we got a few guests here. Well, my friend Chris is joining us on the drums. So make sure you say hi to Chris. He likes starbursts. So if you have any. You give a life, you give a life, you are love, and you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Oh, great are you, Lord. Sing, you give a life, you give a life. You are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, and you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, sing great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give a life. You give a life. You are love. Bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, sing great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. It's your breath. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry and these bones will sing that great are you, Lord. Well, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing that great are you. Come on, let's declare that today. Oh, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. The great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. 
and these bones will sing and they pray are you Lord well it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Great are you, Lord. Yeah. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Lord, we surrender all this to you. We ask that you would inhabit your, uh, the praises of your people, that you would. Uh, be honored and glorified as we worship together today. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Hey, again, welcome to Roots. My name is Travis, and uh, it is awesome to have you here. If you are here for the first time or uh, you're, you're newer to Roots, we want to let you know of a few things that are going on. One of the ways that we communicate is via the email machine, the, the Google machine. And so uh, please drop your name on a card. Uh, with that, we have, a, we have a gift that we'd like to send home with you, a, a coffee cup. Or for some of you who don't drink coffee, I would say it's a, a perfect ice cream cup. Like, it's a good amount of ice cream. And, uh, you know, and if you, if you, as you're eating it, if you get to the end and you just fill it back up a second time, it seems reasonable. So, so uh, yeah, grab a, grab a cup. And uh, also in the back, if you came today and you don't have a Bible, uh, we have some ESV Thin Line Bibles back there. Uh, they're great Bibles, and they, they, could, they last a, a really long time. They're, they're good Bibles, and they're free to you to take, to use. Uh, we often don't put, we don't put many scripture references. We put the reference on the screen, but we don't put the words. And part of that's intentional. We want people to have a Bible in their hands, and we want you to take it home and, and read it and use it, okay? Amen? You got, you got me? So please do that. Uh, you know, this morning, uh, so one of the reasons that Chris is playing with us, and, and Sarah sings with us all the time, though, so she doesn't really count. Uh, but uh, count, this Sarah. band, you we count. got to uh, lead worship this morning at for Gateway. And the reason why that is significant is that it wasn't in this room. It was in uh, the new sanctuary. So we got to be a part of the grand opening. I'd like to say that we are the ones that made it grand. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> If you agree, will you clap your hands? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, we got to go back and watch that again. I only messed up one time, and it was kind of a big mess up, though, to be honest. I was <laughs> like, is it my turn? And they're like, yeah, it's your turn. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, we plan to move into that space uh, on March 6th. Uh, part of it is that, you know, we live in the house, but it's their car, and it's brand new. I don't want to dent the doors, you know what I'm saying? Like, let them dent the doors up first a little bit, and then we can move <laughs> in and uh, spill coffee I in between and, you know, get some, get some Cheez-Its and goldfish between the <laughs> seats, you know? Um, but here's, here's one thing. If you were around, not last week, but the week before, we had a special... Uh, what we call the table gathering, where we put tables out, we actually baked bread, we actually uh, smashed some grapes, and we took communion together. And really, that, that gathering uh, was two parts for me, one part really good and one part really bad. I walked out really inspired and really dissatisfied at the same time. Really inspired to, to that because that communion was so significant and really dissatisfied with what we currently do, okay? Um, and so I've had some conversations with some friends. Actually, these tables right here, uh, I, was, I, I didn't know they were coming today, but thank you, Darius. Uh, I know that they were done, but we, we talked this week about creating some new uh, tables so that we could take communion in a new space in a new way. So there are some significant changes coming. I just say uh, hold on to your seat a little bit. Be patient with us. Uh, next week, I, I think we may actually use these tables to, to, uh, for communion. 
If not ne this next week, it'll be uh, on the on the sixth when we make the move over. So uh, that's the plan. On on March sixth, we will be in that new space worshiping together. Cool. Any questions? Good. Let's move on. Uh, so right now, we uh, I want to invite you uh, to hit pause in your life. It's something that I feel like is is significant because it's part of the reason or it's part of the thing that happens every Sunday when we gather, right? Don't you have to s put certain things on hold and say, I'm going to church now. Like, I'm going to go gather with people. I'm going to go worship Jesus as a, uh, you know, as an individual or as part of a family. And so uh, we, we observe that, I think, every Sunday by the nature of us gathering to together. But we take a moment in our gathering that we call Selah to really uh, dive into it. Uh, to really identify it and say, like, this is a thing that we're doing right now. Uh, Selah is a, is a Hebrew word used throughout the Psalms, which is the book of songs uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, and it most likely meant uh, a moment of pause to, to reflect upon the words or just take a moment in the music to, to just literally, you know, like, hit, hit your own uh, pause button. And that's what we want to do right now is, is, to, is to pause. Pause as we... Uh, ask God to, to move us as we delight in, in the sacred together. Amen? Uh, that we want to take these moments and, and just ask even God, will you, will you speak to, to me? Will you speak to us? Will you move in this place as we submit our hearts to you? So I want you to, I, I want to encourage you during this moment of Selah to take some time to breathe. I feel like I even need to, to do it. I've been kind of going and going today. So that even this moment to take a time, take this time to breathe. Uh, for some of us, it may be a time of repentance. I'd say we'd be bold in our repentance. Use this time to repent. Use this time uh, to confess things to God. Use this time to uh, bless God as you reflect on the ways that he is, is moving or has moved, uh, or the ways that you expect him to move or, or you're asking him to move. But really, let's take this time uh, to breathe. And as we do this, I, we, we ask for, maybe it's a moment of stillness, not a moment of quiet. I don't care if it's, qu who cares if it's quiet? But let's try to still our hearts, right? We know that our kids are going to move around. It doesn't matter. Uh, the noise doesn't matter. Uh, let's, let's try to, to still our hearts. Now, if it's my kid, I'm going to tell them that you better stop it, you know. But your kids, I don't mind, you know. Amen? You get that? You get what I'm saying? Um, but we, as we complete this time of Selah, uh, we will corporately read Psalm 121 together. It's a psalm that we've been meditating on uh, since January 1st, and, and we'll continue to meditate on it for the entire year. Actually, we're committing it to, to memory uh, as well. So let's take a few moments uh, to Selah together, and then um, uh, we'll, we'll read this psalm as well uh, publicly. So will you stand? Will you stand? Let's say la. you declare uh, Psalm 121 with me, a song of ascent. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. I 
stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean let's sing it again I stand amazed I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me, it was in the garden. That he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own grief, but sweat drops of blood for mine. But he took my sins and my sorrows, and he made them his very own. He bore the burden to and he suffered and died alone. Oh, oh, how marvelous and how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When Ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. It will be my joy to the ages to sing of his love for me. Oh, how marvelous and how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. My Savior's love for how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. us and by the cross you came and broke them down you broke them down and there were chains around us by your grace we are no longer bound no longer bound you called me out of the grave you called me into the light you called my name and then my heart came alive oh your love is greater your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater and your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. 
hear the song awaken, all creation singing, we're alive, cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Oh, and what a love we found, that can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. And what a love we found, that can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, oh, a love we found that can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive, oh, what a love we found that can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, and your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens. And how wonderful and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for us. How marvelous, how wonderful is my song shall ever be. Lord, as we come in this place, as we um, just move further into this gathering, as we open your word, as we come to the communion table, as we hear from uh, Aaron and the, the kids' story, as we ponder these things and think about these things, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. That we wouldn't uh, just put off the kids' story till that's, that's for somebody else, but that we would listen in these moments and that we would respond to you as you call us, that we would be those who hear your words and obey, that we would be uh, growing and increasing as disciples in this life, and not just in this place, not just on Sundays or in our gospel communities, but with our families, with our co-workers, with our neighbors, with our, our extended families. Lord, I just pray that you would speak to us, and I guess we know that you're speaking to us, Lord. I pray that we would listen. <laughs> pray that we would listen. Be with us today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. Hello, everyone. My name's Erin. If you don't know me, it's good to see you. So it's February, and it's kind of feels like almost the end of February, but we're finally moving on to the third and fourth verse of Psalm 121. So first, though, I think we should probably... We're going to do the first one, the first two first, because we've got to see if we know it. We're going to add on every week. So let's do the first one together and re try to remember our hand motions. It's been quite a few weeks. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Good job. So this is our, our new part. It says, he will not let your foot be moved. We're going to point up and say, he will not let your foot be moved. Can you guys try that with me? 
He will not let your foot be moved. We're pointing down to those feet. They're sure. Um, he who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps you will not slumber. And then verse 4 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. We're going to say, Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Okay, I'm going to do it one more time, and you can try it the best you can with me, because I'm still learning it too. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Good job, you guys. So be working on that. See if you can start all the way at verse 1 and go all the way through verse 4. Raise your hand if you think you have verse 1 and 2 down by memory. Okay, I want you, those of you who think you have it, after service to come see me because there's like seven pom-poms left in the little box that need to be moved to the jar. So come on, you guys. We, I think we keep forgetting to do this. So come find me, okay? So today's story is from, it's called The Singer. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. I love this one. Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went too. They loved being near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, happy people, sad people, and worried people. Lots of them worrying about lots of things. What if we don't have enough food or clothes or suppose we run out of money? What if there isn't enough and everything goes wrong and we won't be all right? What then? When Jesus saw all the people, his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them down and he talked to them. The people sat quietly on the grassy mountainside and listened. From where they sat, they could see the blue lake glittering below them and little fishing boats coming in from a night's catch. The spring air was fresh and clear. Can you guys imagine yourself there with Jesus in front of you? See those birds over there, Jesus said. Everyone looked. Little sparrows were pecking at seeds along the stony path. Where do they get their food? Perhaps they have pantries all stocked up, cabinets full of food. Everyone laughed. Who's ever seen a bird with a bag of groceries? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God knows what they need and he feeds them. And what about these wildflowers? Everyone looked. All around them, flowers were growing. Anemones, daisies, pure white lilies. Where do they get their lovely clothes? Do they make them? Or do they go to work every day so they can buy them? Do they have closets full of clothes? Everyone laughed again. Who's ever seen a flower putting on a dress? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God clothes them in royal robes of splendor. Not even a king is that well-dressed. They had never met a king, but as they gazed out over the lake, Glittering and sparkling below them, the hillsides dressed in reds, purples, and golds. They felt a great burden lift from their hearts. They could not imagine anything more beautiful. Little flock, Jesus said, you are more important than birds, more important than flowers. The birds and the flowers don't sit and worry about things, and God doesn't want his children to worry either. God loves to look after the birds and the flowers, and he loves to look after you, too. Jesus knew that God would always love and watch over the world he had made. Everything in it, birds, flowers, trees, animals, everything. And most of all, his children. Even though people had forgotten, the birds and the flowers hadn't forgotten. They still knew their song. It was the song all of God's creation had sung to him from the very beginning. It was the song people's hearts were made to sing. God made us. 
He loves us. He is very pleased with us. It was why Jesus had come into this world, to sing them that wonderful song, to sing it not only with his voice, but with his whole life, so that God's children could remember it and join in and sing it too. Uh, and just one quick announcement before Dom comes up. Uh, we will be restarting our kids' classes, Roots Kids' classes, on March 13th. So after we move into the new building on the 6th, we're going to have a family gathering because we don't want anybody to miss out on that first week all together. And then on the 13th, our hope is that our kids' classes will be restarted. So I'm super excited for that. And we've loved having you kids in the gathering, but we're excited to have you in class too. Okay, Dom, come on up. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> I feel like that's a rhetorical question sometimes. Not a question. Rhetorical greeting? Is that a thing? That's not a thing. It is now. Welcome to Roots. My name is Dominic. I'm one of the pastors here. It is a joy to be able to open up God's Word uh, with you today. And as we do, um, we want to pray as a stable part of what we do in community. It's part of our liturgy, and we pray the Lord's Prayer as we open up the scriptures together. And for me, it is this process of coming to the Word with the eyes of a student, the eyes of a disciple, coming with a sense of humility and a sense of trust that our rabbi has something here for us today that's going to transform us, something that's going to feed us, something that is important for our lives. So would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer as we open up his word today? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you today. If you've been with Roots over the last few months, I think last few years, we've been preaching through a series in the Old Testament, primarily focused on the lives of the patriarchs. So we've looked at the stories of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And one of the things that I've loved about this process is we see a consistency, not with the biblical characters, but the God who is consistent and persistent in his purposes to love and redeem people. If you've ever read any portions of the Bible before, you know usually it's not the humans that are the heroes in the story. It's the God who is faithful that is actually the hero generation after generation. And as we finished up that series on the patriarchs, in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph stands in front of all of these people and he makes a proclamation that I think is kind of the heartbeat of the book of Genesis and the Bible as a whole. He says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And it's this process of looking back on his life and realizing this God who is faithful and consistent and persistent is the one who has actually transformed and changed every part of my life. And I love looking at the stories because we have this term, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's also the God of Roots. That is the God of Dominic. That is the God of Travis. This is the God who is still the main character in our lives today. And as we look at this God, we realize something unique about him. From Genesis to Revelation, this is a God who specializes in the work of restoration. God is very good at redeeming things that are broken and sticking with ragtag people and bringing about his good purposes even when we can't make sense of it. So as we looked at the stories of the patriarchs, we looked to the other end of the Bible, and now we're actually going to turn to the story of a familiar character to many of us. We're going to look at the life of Peter. And looking at the life of Peter is going to kind of propel us through the Easter season, which is really just a few weeks away when you think about it. 
And we'll see the same theme, the same heartbeat, that the God who restored and redeemed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph is the same God who redeems kings and prophets, apostles, disciples. It's the same God who is seeking to redeem us today. So as we come to the scriptures, we're going to spend time in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, feel free to open. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. On one occasion, when the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And Jesus saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. As we look at this passage, we're going to build a profile of who this guy Peter is, because I'm fully convinced he creates for us a prototype of what it looks like to experience a redeemed life. And so we're starting at the beginning of his life with Jesus, and we're looking at his call. Specifically, what are the factors that played into Peter's life, and could there possibly be any connections between us and this chief apostle? So all of the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record the story of Peter being called. And if you've ever read them before, you might have been kind of curious, what's going on here? Why would someone who is a commercial fisherman all of a sudden just leave everything for what seems like a complete stranger? Have any of you ever asked that question? In the gospels of Matthew and Mark in particular, it has like two verses. Jesus walks along the lake, says, hey, come follow me, and they drop everything and follow him, right? I thought that was weird. And I think the gospel writer Luke thought it was weird too. He actually expands this section. This is the longest portion about the call of Peter. And as we look at Peter as the prototype of a redeemed life, the first thing I want you to notice is this. There is this thing theologically called provenient grace, okay? And some of you may have never heard this term before, but it basically talks about this idea that God has actually done something in our lives before he calls us, okay? Many of you are familiar with Peter. You know that somewhere in the story, Jesus actually heals Peter's mother-in-law. You guys remember that scene? But if you look in the Gospel of Luke and you turn back a chapter, you realize Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law in chapter 4, right? So chapter 4, Jesus is doing all this incredible stuff. He fights Satan one-on-one -on -one in the desert. He goes and teaches in the synagogues. He goes and casts out demons, and then he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then he starts going out on the lake and starts teaching people. And you, you ask this question, what's the relationship that Peter had with Jesus beforehand? And is it a coincidence that Jesus goes up to Peter out of all the folks if I think about Peter's life, I think he was one of those people who started asking these questions, right? Who is this man that kind of comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden he casts out demons and he heals my mother-in-law and he's teaching in the synagogues and I'm kind of stuck out here on this boat and his word is just capturing my heart. Who is this man? And as Peter looks back on his life, I think he starts to put the pieces together. God is actually working on Peter before he calls him. 
And I think about that with our own lives. Sometimes we forget God has always been at work in our lives. Before he calls us, or before we're even aware that he calls us. And I think about this in the Old Testament. They talk about the sense of Ebenezer's. You set up these monuments so you don't forget. But God has been building Ebenezer's in your life without you even knowing it. You think about your own life. And sometimes we don't have the eyes to see. But one of the things I'm fully convinced of as a pastor is that God is busy being gracious to you before you even know it. And when I talk to you for the first time, I'm not trying to reinvent some sense of like, oh, they've never met God before. I'm always listening to stories because I am convinced God has already been working in your life. And it's my job to get on board with what he's doing rather than try to do something on my own. And if you train your eyes to see, you'll actually notice God has been a part of your life before you started following him. He was prevenient. He went before you and he showed you graciousness and kindness in ways that maybe you've never noticed before. I was raised Catholic, and so one of the things I did was I prayed, even though I didn't really know why I was praying. We just did our fathers and healing. I had these teachers, these people who showed me examples of humility and kindness, but I don't understand why they were so kind when I was so mean to them. And I realized, looking back, God had been putting pillars of faithfulness and graciousness in my life. And when I finally looked back, I said, oh, that was grace. He's actually been gracious to me way before I even knew what the word was. He was provenient in his grace. And friends, I just want to invite you into this. He is doing something in your life that you may not be aware of. And the things that we look in our society and we say, oh, what a funny coincidence. I am fully convinced there are no coincidences with God. I am fully convinced that God is so meticulous and creative and wise and playful that he's actually put events into your life where he's showing you grace without you even knowing it. And in Peter's life, the healing of the mother-in-law, all of these questions start to build a foundation so that when Jesus asks him to do things, they're not complete strangers. Peter feels a certain connection to Jesus already. So Jesus asks him, go out into this boat. And based on the relationship Peter already has with him, he says, okay, Sure, whatever, right? So he goes out, pushes out on the boat. He's tired from a long day. But I think Peter's picking up this sense of there's a grace that's already happened. At the very least, I owe him something because he healed my mother-in-law, but I'm going to follow through. And then the next thing that we see here in this profile of a redeemed life, after Jesus teaches, he turns to Peter, and I think it's striking. We don't actually hear what uh, Jesus is teaching, but he says to Peter, Now, go out into the deep and cast down your net. And we think, oh, what a cool, beautiful, romantic idea. But let me spell out what that actually felt like for Peter. He had fished all night long, and he was exhausted and disappointed, and he had just finished cleaning his nets, right? That's actually a laborious thing. And Jesus says, hey, let's go have fun and go fishing again. And Peter, you can almost hear maybe a sense of sarcasm, Master, we toiled all night, and we took nothing, right? And he's looking at this Jesus. He's like, okay, you're a carpenter's son. What do you know about fishing? They're not even here right now. Why are you telling me to do crazy things? And then he says something beautiful. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And you think, huh, Peter respects Jesus' word, even though he's exhausted even though it doesn't make sense to him. And I can imagine, you know, Peter's looking at his brother Andrew, and you know how people talk with their eyes without saying anything verbally? It's like the big eyes. It's like, are we going to do this? Who is this guy? Are we, are we going to really cast our nets back in? And eventually they come to this decision together, but there is a trepidation because Peter has to let go of this expectation. You know what his expectations are? I want to go to sleep. I am tired. This is not what we do, Jesus. And I think about that. I experience that sometimes when I come into work at Portland Rescue Mission. I start my day at 6 a.m., and I'm relieving the guys of the night shift. 
and they are exhausted. And some nights are really, really tough and chaotic, and I can tell because when I get there on the chaotic nights, the shift reports are ready to be sent out, the coffee cups are cleaned, I can almost smell the anxiety and the afterburn of Red Bull and coffee as they've just survived the night, right? They're ready to go home. And I imagine just waltzing in being like, hey, why don't you stay on for a double shift and we'll do it all again, right? And I think whatever look they would give to me is whatever look Peter gave to Jesus. Are you crazy? We're not doing, or imagine, different station in life, you've had a tough 16 hours with your kids. All day long, they're not listening, they're fighting with each other, they're not eating anything, they have a hard time going to sleep, and you finally get them to sleep. And Jesus comes in with a pot and a pan, and he's about to bang them, and he says, let's play with them again. And I love Jesus. But if he did that, I would look at him and I would say, bro, you do you, but if you wake up these kids, you put them back to sleep, right? We have our expectations in our head, and Jesus comes kind of waltzing in, and we think, what sort of experience, what sort of person is this that tells me, I just cleaned my nets, I don't want to go back out into the deep, this isn't just a five-minute excursion. But I think Peter's done the work to say, wow, at Jesus' word, he cast out demons, at Jesus' word, he healed my mother-in-law. And maybe at his word, there's something there for me. And this profile of being a redeemed person is realizing God has done amazing things, whether you're aware of them or not. And maybe when he's calling you into something, he's asking you to act in faith, even though you don't have the full picture. And to do that requires some hard things. It means letting go of your expectations of what your life will be like. Letting go of your expectation that maybe you won't get as much sleep tonight. I know this. This is a hard one because we had children who didn't sleep. Letting go of the expectation that life should go in this way. Letting go of the idea, this is what my family is and what it's going to be. Letting go of the idea, I live in this house and this is what we do. This is the career that I'm moving in. Jesus, don't speak to me about that because I want it to go on this track. Whatever it is for you, realize maybe God's prodding and poking and asking you to do things that don't make sense. But in doing so, Peter witnesses a miracle. He throws the net into the water. You can almost, I, I, I picture him with a smirk on his face, like, okay, Jesus, what are you going to do? And then all of a sudden, these schools of fish start filling up the nets, so much so he can't even pull it up. He calls his friends over. The boats are starting to sink. And there is this moment where he realizes, oh my goodness, look at all of this fish, right? He is a fisherman. He doesn't just see fish flopping around. He sees, this is months worth of pay. Thank you, Jesus. I can go on a vacation. I can finally buy good food. I can buy the medication. But something unique happens when he acts in faith. He sees what happens in those questions he's asking. Who is this man that can cast out demons and rebuke a fever? And now he controls creation. And listen to what Peter says. When Peter saw all of what happened, he falls to Jesus' knees. And he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter feels a sense of conviction. And I think that that's the third thing that we see in a life of a person who is redeemed. They look beyond the temporal gifts and they realize I am actually not just standing here with a bunch of fish. I am actually standing on sacred ground because the God of the universe has met me here. This is not a coincidence. This is a miracle that is unrivaled to anything Peter has ever experienced in his life. This is a sacred moment, and we talked about this trap preached on gathering to delight in the sacred, where we come in contact with something that is not of this world. And what happens to Peter is significant. He feels conviction. And that's a hard thing to preach, I'll just say that. It's fun to preach about things that are light and easy, but when he looks at Jesus and he says, oh my 
gosh, you are actually the God of all creation. And the first thing off his lips, please stay away from me, I am sinful. There is something important about that sense of conviction. But I'm fully convinced of this. To experience the life of sacredness where we touch the living God, we have to pass through this door of conviction of our sin. We have to grow in this awareness that I have a reverent fear before this God who holds my breath in his hand. But our culture does not value conviction. Our culture values comfort. And any time an, an idea, a remote sense that maybe I'm going to feel convicted or bad about something, you know what culture says? It says, don't think about that. Just look over here. Compare your life with this celebrity. Their life is falling apart. Doesn't that make you feel a little bit more comfortable? Right? Or they say, hey, forget about that. Why don't you watch this next YouTube video about cats? Right? And you're like, huh, okay. And you watch the cats, and all of a sudden, all your discomfort goes away. Your conviction goes away, and you're just amused into oblivion, right? Culture is really good at giving us a fork in the road where either we can feel the, this discomfort of conviction, or we can feel comfort. But if we take this road of comfort, we will never experience the sacred. We will never fully acknowledge the difference between us and the holy living God. And it's only through this door of discomfort that we can actually begin to see God for who he is. It is a very taboo idea to talk about the conviction of sin. But I want to say this. It is okay to feel convicted over your sin because it's real. If we don't acknowledge the realness of who we are, we're not bringing our true selves before God. And like Peter, we have the sense that's almost a knee-jerk reaction. And we've seen this before with other biblical characters, haven't we? When they stand in the presence of God, what's the first thing that jumps out of their mouth, right? So Moses is talking to the burning bush. He realizes, oh my goodness, this is Yahweh. And he takes off his sandals and he realizes, I am not like you. This is holy ground. Or you think about the prophet Isaiah, who sees the throne in heaven surrounded by cherubims, and the first thing out of his mouth, oh God, help me, I'm dead, because I am a sinful person living in a sinful land. I cannot be here, right? Or you look at Ezekiel. He sees the glory of God, and he falls to the ground as if he's dead because he's convicted of his sin. The same God who is gracious and kind is also the God who wields all power and authority. It is a God who is holy. And if you don't see that, you're not actually seeing the same God that Peter saw. God, I'm sinful. Please depart from me. So there's recognizing that God has been gracious, provenient grace. There's a sense of acting in faith. There's uh, the idea that we allow ourselves to feel conviction as we see God. And one of the last things that we see here, which I think is so beautiful, is Jesus' response. First of all, he doesn't sweep Peter's discomfort under the rug. When I read this and I think, oh, he feels so bad, one of my things is I want to say, oh, it's okay, Peter. You're fine. Let's look at all this fish. Look at them flopping. I just want to change the subject because I'm so uncomfortable. And Jesus doesn't change the subject. He allows Peter to realize his own sinfulness. And then he says something unique. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And you think about that, that's a really strange idea, right? What do you mean you're going to catch men? And I think when Jesus gives Peter this offer, there is something unique that happens. Jesus is looking at Peter, this full package of who this man is, this hot-headed person who just wants to go to sleep right now, but he realizes these pieces are moving together, and Jesus looks at him and he says, I want all of you. You used to fish for these things, but now you're going to capture men and women's souls for me. You used to fish for these animals, but now I'm going to transmute your skills and your abilities and your experiences. You still get to be a fisherman, but you're my fisherman now. When we look at the story of the redemption that happens in Peter's life, I love the reality 
that it's not actually a coincidence. Okay? I don't think Jesus had like this great one-liner in his head, like, I need to find a fisherman so I can say, you're going to catch souls for me. I think he actually looks at Peter and he says, I want all of you, and I see you're so tied with your identity as a fisherman, and now you're my fisherman. Okay? And I think he looks at each one of us, and he has that same invitation. When he looks at us, he realizes it's not a coincidence that we are the people that we are. He was a fisherman, so now he will fish for Jesus. And if he looks at a teacher, he looks at them and he says, you can still have all your skills and gifts and talents, but now you're a teacher for me. He looks at people who are fastidious, note-taking tax collectors, and he says, Matthew, you're mine. You're weird, you're quirky, and you're mine, right? And then, lo and behold, Matthew writes this really detailed account of what it looks like to follow Jesus from a Jewish perspective, right? And he looks at other people, and he, he realizes there's something unique in them. And you think about it, he did it with Paul. Do you think it's a coincidence that he chose a multilingual scholar who was a citizen of Rome, who had all the abilities and talents to actually speak in all these different places, or was that actually part of his grand plan? Did he actually randomly pick Luke, who was a physician, who could actually document things really well and explain things with precision to create the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts? It's not a coincidence. He chose these people because of who they were, and he chose Peter not because of his credentials, not because he was great, but because he was a person who could see Jesus for who he was. I look at Roots and I think about this. To be a Christ follower doesn't mean to change who you are. It just changes the devotion of your heart and what you're doing. Right? Do you drive a bus? Cool. Can you drive a bus for Jesus? Are you a mechanic? Are you really good at fixing things? Guess what? You can do that for Jesus too. Are you an engineer? Do your skills bring you to this place where you can think thoroughly about how to make a sale, how to fix a product? Guess what? You can do that for Jesus too. He takes all the skills that exist here in this room and he transmutes them and redeems them for his kingdom. And it even goes beyond that. What's your station in life? Are you a parent? Did you know he wants you to parent for him? Are you single? Guess what? He wants that too. He wants you to be single for him. Are you retired? And you think, oh, I'm done. Guess what? He wants that too. He wants to utilize every fiber of who you are, your skills, and even your personality. I look at my two daughters, and they are like day and night sometimes. One is wild and crazy, able to jump off of things without knowing where she's going to land, and the other is so careful, so detail-oriented. And I see Jesus watching them with this grin on his face, and he says, are you fun and silly? Guess what? You can be fun and silly for me. And he looks at others, and he says, are you a little bit more careful? Are you more measured? Guess what? I want that too. And as Jesus throws out this net and he says, I want all of you to participate with me. I want us to awaken to this idea. He wants to redeem every aspect of our lives. Whether we are silly, whether we are intellectual, whether we are hot-headed, whether we like to move slowly, whether we are loud, whether we are quiet, Jesus wants all of that. And part of his redemption is taking the whole package and bringing it before him where we can actually say, you know what's best. When Peter interacts with Jesus, I think he sees this fuller picture. He doesn't get lost with the fish. And as the story plays out, they bring the boats to the shore and they leave everything and follow him. What would it take for you to be convinced that Jesus has something better for you? What would it take for you to see or experience where you can lay down the expectations of how your life ought to be, 
and even to lay down the comforts of having a big cash of income, a certain way of life, a certain way of being seen, and say, Jesus, I think you actually know what's better for me. In our call, in our own lives, do we know how God is calling our hearts in our unique ways? He doesn't want you to look like Peter. He doesn't want you to look like me. He doesn't want you to look like Trav. He wants you to be who you really are because he created you just the way he wanted you to be so that you could contribute in a unique way to the kingdom of God. And as we look at the story of redemption, as we see this prototype in Peter, would we too join in this story that the God who transformed the patriarchs, the God who spoke through the prophets and shaped the apostles is still shaping us today? This is not some theology that existed 2,000 years ago across an ocean in a different language. This is the same God who is speaking to you now. He wants to invite you. He wants every part of you. There is no mistake, there is nothing in your past that disqualifies you from joining him in this work. And Jesus, who specializes in redeeming dark things, even says, I don't want just the nice parts of your personality. I even want the darkness and the wounds. Because even those things I will use to build my kingdom. A lot of the work that I do is in recovery. So people who are getting out of drug and alcohol addiction. And one of the things I love most about that is that I don't have a great voice in that because I am not a peer mentor. The people who speak powerfully into the lives of people in addiction are the people who have found recovery themselves, right? Because even in their wounds and their healing, they can turn around and say, hey, I have something to offer you because I've been down this road before. And even the hardest, darkest parts that may bring you shame or discomfort, guess what? God wants that too because he redeems it and brings it to the forefront and he says, this is how you'll build the kingdom with me. I had a professor, and he said it in a unique way, show me your greatest wounds, and I'll show you where God has called you to minister. There is a reality to that. And as I think about what Jesus is doing in our lives, I remember that as well. He took on a crazy amount of chaos and stress. He took on our wounds so he could be a real savior to us. He is not unfamiliar with our suffering and our pain. He actually dwelt with us. He felt the frustration of what it felt like to be in this world. And yet, he still offers us something unique. He offers us grace and redemption. And so as we come to the table today, I just want you to have this sense. It is not a coincidence that you are here. It is not a coincidence that we're coming to this table to receive his broken body and his shed blood. As you take these elements of bread and juice, I just want you to realize he's calling you to participate in building his kingdom. He wants you to commune with him, to experience him and his forgiveness and his grace and his transformation and his redemption because he wants all of you. He gave everything. He gave his life so that you could give your life back to him. So notice the grace. Act in faith and trust. If you put the nets down into the deep, he has something for you. Feel the conviction of your sin and allow every part of your life to be redeemed by him. I'm going to pray. We'll receive these elements together. So as you come up, um, there's these little packages. You take off the top. There's a wafer there. There's juice underneath. I encourage you to take these elements of communion together. And as you come up for communion, uh, the worship team will be here. They're going to continue to play some songs. I'm also going to be off on the corner over here to pray with anyone who would like prayer and support. As we think about this idea of being redeemed people, I just want you to know, you're not in this alone. We are in this together. There is a transformation that occurs 
when we allow each other to pick up this load, when we look into the darkness of our lives and we say, how could God use this? I just want to affirm, he has, and he can, and he will. So as I'm praying up there, I encourage the gospel community leaders, come up, join me as we pray as a community. And would we take uh, these elements today to remember and proclaim that Jesus is faithful. There is nothing outside of his plan, and even the darkness of the cross he has redeemed for our good. Would we surrender to that truth? Would we celebrate that? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the story of Peter, a person who is not a saint, as the Gospels record it, but someone who is like us. And we thank you, Lord, for your consistency and your patience to keep pursuing us, your desire to partner with us and to redeem every part of our lives. And Father, as we receive the gift of your Son through this communion today, would we know that you are a God who brings new life and restoration to things that are broken? Would we offer our lives to you as a living sacrifice, trusting what you will do in and through us, just like you did through Peter, just like you've done through the saints in the past, and what you will do here, even in Roots. We love you. We act in faith now and trust you as we go into the deep, as we cast our nets, and we trust you to transform us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The tables are open. Come on up.
our fears and doubts, and they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. Oh, it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that I knew. Oh, oh, all my fears and doubts, and they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe in love. The truth, the life, I believe. Amen. Roots, can I bless you? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord who was pursuing you with grace long before you ever recognized it, may he now give you fresh grace. Grace to see him as he is, grace to see the world as he sees it, and grace to live every moment in submission to his goodwill. Go and be blessed.